Lord Jim by Joseph Conrad, Chapters Twenty One and Twenty Two. Chapter Twenty One. I don't suppose any of you have ever heard of Patizan," Marlow resumed after a silence occupied in the careful lighting of a cigar. It does not matter. There's many a heavenly body in the lot crowding upon us of a night that mankind has never heard of, it being outside the sphere of its activities and of no earthly importance to anybody, but to the astronomers who are paid to talk learnedly about its composition, weight, path, the irregularities of its conduct, the aberrations of its light, a sort of scientific scandal-mongering. Thus with Patizan, it was referred to knowingly in the inner government circles in Batavia, especially as to its irregularities and aberrations, and it was known by name to some few, very few, in the mercantile world. Nobody, however, had been there, and I suspect no one desired to go there in person, just as an astronomer, I should fancy, would strongly object to being transported into a distant heavenly body where, parted from his earthly emoluments, he would be bewildered by the view of an unfamiliar heavens. However, neither heavenly bodies nor astronomers have anything to do with Patizan. It was Jim who went there. I only meant you to understand that, had Stein arranged to send him to a star of the fifth magnitude, the change could not have been greater. He left his earthly failings behind him, and what sort of reputation he had, and there was a totally new set of conditions for his imaginative faculty to work upon, entirely new, entirely remarkable, and he got hold of them in a remarkable way. Stein was the man who knew more about Patizan than anybody else, more than was known in the government circles, I suspect. I have no doubt he had been there, either in his butterfly-hunting days, or later on, when he tried, in his incorrigible way, to season with a pinch of romance the fattening dishes of his commercial kitchen. There were very few places in the archipelago he had not seen in the original dusk of their being before light, and even electric light, had been carried into them for the sake of better morality and—and— and well, the greater profit, too. It was at breakfast of the morning following our talk about Jim that he mentioned the place, after I had quoted poor Briarly's remark, uh, let him creep twenty feet underground and stay there. He looked up at me with interested attention, as though I had been a rare insect. This could be done, too, he remarked, sipping his coffee. Bury him in some sort, I explained. One doesn't like to do it, of course, but it would be the best thing, seeing what he is. Yes, he is young, Stein mused. The youngest human being now in existence, I affirmed. Schön. There's Patizan, he went on in the same tone. And the woman is dead now, he added incomprehensibly. Of course, I don't know that story. I can only guess that once before— Patizan had been used for the grave of some sin, transgression, or misfortune. It is impossible to suspect Stein. The only woman that had ever existed for him was the Malay girl he called My Wife the Princess, or, more rarely, in moments of expansion, the mother of my Emma. Who was the woman he had mentioned in connection with Patizan, I can't say— but from his allusions I understand she had been an educated and very good-looking Dutch Malay girl with a tragic, or perhaps only a pitiful, history, whose most painful part, no doubt, was her marriage with a Malacca Portuguese who had been a clerk in some commercial house in the Dutch colonies. I gathered from Stein that this man was an unsatisfactory person in more ways than one, all being more or less indefinite and offensive. It was solely for his wife's sake that Stein had appointed him manager of Stein and Company's trading post in Patizan, but commercially the arrangement was not a success, at any rate for the firm, and now the woman had died, Stein was disposed to try another agent there. The Portuguese, whose name was Cornelius, considered himself a very deserving but ill-used person, entitled by his abilities to a better position. 
This man Jim would have to relieve. "'But I don't think he will go away from the place,' remarked Stein. "'That has nothing to do with me. It was only for the sake of the woman that I... Uh... "'But I think there is a daughter left. I shall let him, if he likes, stay, keep the old house.' Patizan is a remote district of a native-ruled state, and the chief settlement bears the same name. At a point on the river, about forty miles from the sea, where the first houses come into view, there can be seen rising above the level of the forest the summits of two steep hills very close together, and separated by what looks like a deep fissure, the cleavage of some mighty stroke. As a matter of fact, the valley between is nothing but a narrow ravine, the appearance from the settlement is of one irregularly conical hill split in two, and with the two halves leaning slightly apart. On the third day after the full, the moon is seen from the open space in front of Jim's house. He had a very fine house in the native style when I visited him. Rose exactly behind these hills, its diffused light at first throwing the two masses into intensely black relief, and then the nearly perfect disk, glowing ruddily, appeared, gliding upwards between the sides of the chasm till it floated away above the summits, as if escaping from a yawning grave in gentle triumph. "'Wonderful effect,' said Jim by my side. "'Worth seeing, is it not?' And this question was put with a note of personal pride that made me smile, as though he had had a hand in regulating that unique spectacle." He had regulated so many things in Patizan, things that would have appeared as much beyond his control as the motions of the moon and the stars. It was inconceivable. That was the distinctive quality of the part into which Stein and I had tumbled him unwittingly, with no other notion than to get him out of the way, out of his own way, be it understood. That was our main purpose, though... I own I might have had another motive which had influenced me a little. I was about to go home for a time, and it may be I desired, more than I was aware of myself, to dispose of him. To dispose of him, you understand, before I left. I was going home, and he had come to me from there, with his miserable trouble and his shadowy claim, like a man panting under a burden in a mist. I could not say I had ever seen him distinctly, not even to this day after I had my last view of him. But it seemed to me that the less I understood, the more I was bound to him in the name of that doubt which is the inseparable part of our knowledge. I did not know so much more about myself. And then, I repeat, I was going home, to that home distant enough for all its hearthstones to be like one hearthstone, by which the humble of us has a right to sit. We wander in our thousands over the face of the earth, the illustrious and the obscure, earning beyond the sea our fame, our money, or only a crust of bread. But it seems to me that for each of us going home must be like going to render an account. We return to face our superiors, our kindred, our friends, those whom we obey, those whom we love, but even they who have neither, the most free, lonely, irresponsible, and bereft of ties, even those for whom home holds no dear face, no familiar voice, even they have to meet the spirit that dwells within the land, under its sky, in its air, in its valleys, and on its rises, in its fields, in its waters, and its trees, a mute friend, judge, and inspirer. Say what you like, to get its joy, to breathe its peace, to face its truth, one must return with a clear conscience. All this may seem to you sheer sentimentalism, and indeed very few of us have the will or the capacity to look consciously under the surface of familiar emotions. There are the girls we love, the men we look up to, the tenderness, the friendships, the opportunities, the pleasures— but the fact remains that you must touch your reward with clean hands, lest it turn to dead leaves, to thorns in your grasp. I think it is the lonely, without a fireside or an affection they may call their own, those who return not to a dwelling but to the land itself, 
to meet its disembodied, eternal, and unchangeable spirit. It is those who understand best its severity, its saving power, the grace of its secular right to our fidelity, to our obedience. Yes, a few of us understand. But we all feel it, though, and I say all without exception, because those who do not feel do not count. Each blade of grass has its spot on the earth whence it draws its life, its strength, and so is man rooted to the land from which he draws his faith together with his life. I don't know how much Jim understood, but I know he felt, he felt confusedly but powerfully, the demand of some such truth or some such illusion. I don't care how you call it, there is so little difference, and the difference means so little. The thing is that in virtue of his feeling he mattered. He would never go home now, not he, never. Had he been capable of picturesque manifestations, he would have shuddered at the thought, and made you shudder too. But he was not of that sort, though he was expressive enough in his way. Before the idea of going home he would grow desperately stiff and immovable, with lowered chin and pouted lips, and with those candid blue eyes of his glowering darkly under a frown, as if before something unbearable, as if before something revolting. There was imagination in that hard skull of his, over which the thick clustering hair fitted like a cap. As to me, I have no imagination. I would be more certain about him to-day if I had. And I do not mean to imply that I figured to myself the spirit of the land uprising above the white cliffs of Dover to ask me what I, returning with no bones broken, so to speak, had done with my very young brother. I could not make such a mistake. I knew very well he was one of those about whom there is no inquiry. I had seen better men go out, disappear, vanish utterly, without provoking a sound of curiosity or sorrow. The spirit of the land, as becomes the ruler of great enterprises, is careless about innumerable lives. Woe to the stragglers! We exist only in so far as we hang together. He had straggled in a way, he had not hung on, but he was aware of it with an intensity that made him touching, just as a man's more intense life makes his death more touching than the death of a, a tree. I happen to be handy and I happened to be touched. That's all there is to it. I was concerned as to the way he would go out. It would have hurt me if, for instance, he had taken to drink. The earth is so small that I was afraid of some day being waylaid by a blear-eyed, swollen-faced, besmirched loafer with no soles to his canvas shoes, and with a flutter of rags about the elbows, who, on the strength of old acquaintance, would ask for a loan of five dollars. You know the awful, jaunty bearing of these scarecrows coming to you from a decent past, the rasping, careless voice, the half-averted, impudent glances, those meetings more trying to a man who believes in the solidarity of our lives than the sight of an impenitent deathbed to a priest. That, to tell you the truth, was the only danger I could see for him and for me. But I also mistrusted my want of imagination— it might even come to something worse, in some way it was beyond my powers of fancy to foresee. You wouldn't let me forget how imaginative he was, and your imaginative people swing farther in any direction, as if given a longer scope of cable in the uneasy anchorage of life. They do. They take to drink, too. It may be I was belittling him by such a fear. How could I tell? Even Stein could say no more than that he was romantic. I only knew he was one of us. And what business had he to be romantic? I am telling you so much about my own instinctive feelings and bemused reflections, because there remains so little to be told of him. He existed for me, and, after all, it is only through me that he exists for you. I have led him out by the hand. I have paraded him before you. Were my commonplace fears unjust? I won't say, not even now. You may be able to tell better, since the proverb has it that the onlookers see most of the game. At any rate, they were superfluous. He did not go out, not at all. On the contrary, he came on wonderfully, 
came on straight as a die in an excellent form, which showed that he could stay as well as spurt. I ought to be delighted, for it is a victory in which I had taken my part. But I am not so pleased as I would have expected to be. I ask myself whether his rush had really carried him out of that mist in which he loomed, interesting, if not very big, with floating outlines, a straggler yearning inconsolably for his humble place in the ranks. And besides, the last word is not said, probably shall never be said. Are not our lives too short for that full utterance, which through all our stammerings is of course our only and abiding intention? I have given up expecting those last words, whose ring, if they could only be pronounced, would shake both heaven and earth. There is never time to say our last word, the last word of our love, of our desire, faith, remorse, submissions, revolt. The heaven and the earth must not be shaken, I suppose, at least not by us who know so many truths about either. My last words about Jim shall be few. I affirm he had achieved greatness, but the thing would be dwarfed in the telling, or rather in the hearing. Frankly, it is not my words that I mistrust, but uh, your minds. I could be eloquent were I not afraid you fellows had starved your imaginations to feed your bodies. I do not mean to be offensive. It is respectable to have no illusions, and safe, and profitable, and dull. Yet you, too, in your time must have known the intensity of life, that light of glamour created in the shock of trifles, as amazing as the glow of sparks struck from a cold stone, and as short-lived, alas. CHAPTER Twenty Two. The conquest of love, honour, men's confidence, the pride of it, the power of it, are fit materials for a heroic tale. Only our minds are struck by the externals of such a success, and to Jim's successes there were no externals. Thirty miles of forest shut it off from the sight of an indifferent world, and the noise of the white surf along the coast overpowered the voice of fame. The stream of civilization, as if divided on a headland a hundred miles north of Padazan, branches east and southeast, leaving its plains and valleys, its old trees and its old mankind, neglected and isolated, such as an insignificant and crumbling islet between two branches of a mighty devouring stream. You find the name of the country pretty often in collections of old voyages, the seventeenth-century traders went there for pepper, because the passion for pepper seemed to burn like a flame of love in the breasts of Dutch and English adventurers about the time of James I. Where wouldn't they go for pepper? For a bag of pepper they would cut each other's throats without hesitation, and would forswear their souls, of which they were so careful otherwise. The bizarre obstinacy of that desire made them defy death in a thousand shapes, the unknown seas, the loathsome and strange diseases, wounds, captivity, hunger, pestilence, and despair. It made them great. By heavens, it made them heroic. And it made them pathetic, too, in their craving for trade, with the inflexible death levying its toll on young and old. It seems impossible to believe that mere greed could hold men to such a steadfastness of purpose to such a blind persistence in endeavour and sacrifice. And, indeed, those who adventured their persons and lives risked all they had for a slender reward. They left their bones to lie bleaching on distant shores so that wealth might flow to the living at home. To us, their less tried successors, they appear magnified, not as agents of trade, but as instruments of a recorded destiny, pushing out into the unknown in obedience to an inward voice, to an impulse beating in the blood, to a dream of the future. They were wonderful, and it must be owned that they were ready for the wonderful. They recorded it complacently in their sufferings, in the aspect of the seas, in the customs of strange nations, in the glory of splendid rulers. In Patizan they had found lots of pepper, and had been impressed by the magnificence and the wisdom of the sultan. 
but somehow after a century of checkered intercourse the country seems to drop gradually out of the trade. Perhaps the pepper had given out. Be it as it may, nobody cares for it now. The glory has departed. The sultan is an imbecile youth with two thumbs on his left hand, and an uncertain and beggarly revenue, extorted from a miserable population and stolen from him by his many uncles. This, of course, I have from Stein. He gave me their names and a short sketch of the life and character of each. He was as full of information about native states as an official report, but uh, infinitely more amusing. He had to know. He traded in so many, and in some districts, as in Patizan, for instance, his firm was the only one to have an agency by special permit from the Dutch authorities. The government trusted his discretion, and it was understood that he took all the risks. The men he employed understood that, too, but he made it worth their while, apparently. He was perfectly frank with me over the breakfast-table in the morning. As far as he was aware, the last news was thirteen months old, he stated precisely, utter insecurity for life and property was the normal condition. There were in Patizan antagonistic forces, and one of them was Raja Alang, the worst of the sultan's uncles, the governor of the river, who did the extorting and the stealing, and ground down to the point of extinction the country-born Malays, who, utterly defenceless, had not even the resource of emigrating. For indeed, as Stein remarked, where could they go, and how could they get away? No doubt they did not even desire to get away. The world, which is circumscribed by lofty, impassable mountains, has been given into the hands of the high-born, and this Rajah they knew. He was of their own royal house. I had the pleasure of meeting the gentleman later on, he was a dirty, little, used-up old man, with evil eyes and a weak mouth who swallowed an opium pill every two hours, and in defiance of common decency wore his hair uncovered and falling in wild, stringy locks about his wizened, grimy face. When giving audience he would clamber upon a sort of narrow stage erected in a hall like a ruinous barn with a rotten bamboo floor through the cracks of which you could see twelve or fifteen feet below, the heaps of refuse and garbage of all kinds lying under the house. That is where and how he received us when, accompanied by Jim, I paid him a visit of ceremony. There were about forty people in the room, and perhaps three times as many in the great courtyard below. There was a constant movement, coming and going, pushing and murmuring at our backs. A few youths in gay silks glared from the distance. The majority, slaves and humble dependents, were half-naked in ragged sarongs, dirty with ashes and mud-stains. I had never seen Jim look so grave, so self-possessed, in an impenetrable, impressive way. In the midst of these dark-faced men, his stalwart figure in white apparel, the gleaming clusters of his fair hair seemed to catch all the sunshine that trickled through the cracks in the closed shutters of that dim hall with its walls of mats and a roof of thatch. He appeared like a creature not only of another kind, but of another essence. Had they not seen him come up in a canoe, they might have thought that he had descended upon them from the clouds. He did, however, come in a crazy dugout, sitting very still, and with his knees together, for fear of overturning the thing, uh, sitting on a tin box which I had lent him nursing on his lap a revolver of the navy pattern presented by me on parting, which, through an interposition of providence, or through some wrong-headed notion that was just like him, or else from sheer instinctive sagacity, he had decided to carry unloaded. That's how he ascended the Patizan River. Nothing could have been more prosaic and more unsafe, more extravagantly casual, more lonely. Strange, this fatality that would cast the complexion of a flight upon all his acts, of impulsive, unreflecting desertion of the jump into the unknown. It is precisely the casualness of it that strikes me most. Neither Stein nor I had a clear conception of what might be on the other side when we, metaphorically speaking, took him up and hove him over the wall with scant ceremony— at the moment I merely wished to achieve his disappearance. Stein, characteristically enough, had a sentimental motive. 
He had a notion of paying off, in kind, I suppose, the old debt he had never forgotten. Indeed, he had been all his life especially friendly to anybody from the British Isles. His late benefactor, it is true, was a Scot, even to the length of being called Alexander McNeil, and Jim came from a long way south of the Tweed. But at a distance of six or seven thousand miles, Great Britain, though never diminished, looks foreshortened enough even to its own children to rob such details of their importance. Stein was excusable, and his hinted intentions were so generous that I begged him most earnestly to keep them secret for a time. I felt that no consideration of personal advantage should be allowed to influence Jim, that not even the risk of such influence should be run. We had to deal with another sort of reality. He wanted a refuge, and a refuge at the cost of danger should be offered him. Nothing more. Upon every other point I was perfectly frank with him, and I even, as I believed at the time, exaggerated the danger of the undertaking. As a matter of fact, I did not do it justice. His first day on Patazan was nearly his last, would have been his last, if he had not been so reckless or so hard on himself, and had condescended to load that revolver. I remember, as I unfolded our precious scheme for his retreat, how his stubborn but weary resignation was gradually replaced by surprise, interest, wonder, and by boyish eagerness. This was the chance he had been dreaming of. He couldn't think how he merited that I— He would be shot if he could see that to what he owed. And it was Stein, Stein the merchant, who— But of course it was me he had to— I cut him short. He was not articulate, and his gratitude caused me inexplicable pain. I told him that if he owed this chance to any one especially, it was to an old Scot of whom he had never heard, who had died many years ago, and of whom little was remembered besides a roaring voice and a rough sort of honesty. There was really no one to receive his thanks. Stein was passing on to a young man the help he had received in his own young days, and I had done no more than to mention his name. Upon this he coloured, and, twisting a bit of paper in his fingers, he remarked bashfully that I had always trusted him. I admitted that such was the case, and added after a pause that I wished he had been able to follow my example. "'You think I don't?' he asked uneasily, and remarked in a mutter that one had to get some sort of show first. Then, brightening up, and in a loud voice, he protested that he would give me no occasion to regret my confidence. "'Which, which—' "'Do not misapprehend,' I interrupted. "'It is not in your power to make me regret anything. "'There would be no regrets, but if there were, "'it would be altogether my own affair. "'On the other hand, I wished him to understand clearly "'that this arrangement, this, uh, this experiment, "'was his own doing. "'He was responsible for it, and no one else. "'Why, why,' he stammered, "'this is the very thing that I—' I begged him not to be dense, and he looked more puzzled than ever. He was in a fair way to make life intolerable to himself. "'Do you think so?' he asked, disturbed, but in a moment added confidently, "'I was going on, though. Was I not?' It was impossible to be angry with him. I could not help a smile, and I told him that in the old days people who went on like this were on the way of becoming hermits in a wilderness." "'Hermits be hanged,' he commented, with engaging impulsiveness. "'Of course he didn't mind a wilderness.' "'I was glad of it,' I said. "'That was where he would be going to. "'He would find it lively enough, I ventured to promise. "'Yes, yes,' he said keenly. "'He had shown a desire,' I continued inflexibly, "'to go out and shut the door after him. "'Did I?' he interrupted, "'in a strange access of gloom that seemed to envelop him from head to foot.' like the shadow of a passing cloud. He was wonderfully expressive, after all. Wonderfully. Did I? he repeated bitterly. You can't say I made much noise about it. And I can keep it up, too. Only, confound it, you show me a door. Very well. Pass on, I struck in. I could make him a solemn promise that it would be shut behind him with a vengeance. His fate, whatever it was, would be ignored, because the country, for all its rotten state, was not judged ripe for interference. Once he got in, 
It would be for the outside world as though he had never existed. He would have nothing but the soles of his two feet to stand upon, and he would have first to find his ground at that. Never existed. <laughs> That's it, by Jove, he murmured to himself. His eyes, fastened upon my lips, sparkled. If he had thoroughly understood the conditions, I concluded, he had better jump into the first gary he could see, and drive on to Stein's house for his final instructions. He flung out of the room before I had fairly finished speaking. End of chapters 21 and 22